again, thank you guys. Um, I think next summer we should just do a church cruise. <laughs> Separate boats. You want to be on the same boat as me? Oh my gosh. Oh, wait, I didn't, I'm not signed up for that. Yeah. Hallelujah. But it was good. I recommend it. Amen. And uh, we, didn't, we didn't even have, I'm addicted to it. We didn't even have internet. It was so great. And I thought that I would hate that, but no, it was really good. And uh, we had a good time. Praise God. Well, today is Pentecost, hallelujah, and uh, we just, uh, as I said earlier, God commands His people to celebrate on Pentecost, and, um, you know, it's a time of celebration, and, you know, the thing about Pentecost, and of course, you know, if you, if you study all these things out, and you study Passover, and the Lord basically had the, the children of Israel count 50 days from Passover to Pentecost, and Pentecost didn't start on the day the church was born. God always had His people celebrate Pentecost. And, and the reason, one of the things that God really did was He had um, people celebrate so they could position themselves, first of all, to be thankful. How many of you know it's so important to be thankful in your life? I mean, if we don't live in thankfulness, um, it, it actually so hinders us personally and I believe a lack of thankfulness just hinders what God is doing in our life. Now, God's faithful, but thankfulness just makes everything so much easier and better. And so, as we think on the last season, we also, and we're thankful for what God did, that it really positions us to receive the new thing that God wants to do, right? And uh, God's wanting to do some new things. And so not only was the church birthed on, um, on Pentecost, but this particular church was birthed on a Pentecost Sunday. And this is actually our 11th anniversary as a church. And um, so I, I, I don't want to take the whole service talking about that, but I feel like for just a few moments, I just want to give a quick testimony of how God birthed this ministry and, uh, you know, when God, when God sent us, we'd been in Japan for almost five years, and God began to speak to us to come back to Ardmore. Ardmore is my hometown, Jamie's hometown of Sulphur. And, you know, we joke about that when we got married that we had a prenuptial agreement that we would never live in Ardmore again. And so, but we begin to, I began to have a series of visions and dreams while in the nation of Japan about a move of God in Oklahoma. And specifically, I saw it affecting the whole state. But then I began to see specific areas where God was moving, and I had a number of dreams about what God wanted to do in Ardmore. And I literally wrote it up, typed it up, and gave it to other people that lived here and said, you're on. God wants to do this. And God's probably just like, <laughs> he's really laughing because he's like, I'm going to ask you to go back. Right? And I, something that was just not on our radar at all. And so, you know, and then after that series of dreams, God began to say, no, I want you to go back. And it was not on our radar to even start a church. And, and we were in the middle of an international adoption. And, and those are difficult processes. And even in that process, we were initially told we couldn't bring... Yeah, it's Mia. Uh, <laughs> We were initially told we couldn't bring Mia back to America. That's exciting, isn't it? We're gonna. We started to come through the Mexican border, and uh, <laughs> swim the Red River because apparently you can do that. And uh, <laughs> it's amazing when you follow the law. Again, I'm trying. I'm not trying to be political at all, y'all. I'm so sorry. Uh, but you know. But that whole process has given me compassion. I'm just going to say that. It really has because U.S. immigration is a bear. And, uh, but the Lord was faithful and he got us here. And so we're here. And, you know, when God tells you to do something, you think it's all going to be fun and games. But um, about a year in, we actually, maybe not even that far, nine months in, we found ourselves in a, a great time of turmoil and difficulty. And so one night... I, I can't sleep, and I'd actually um, emailed a spiritual father in um, in Japan and said, "Man, we're we're having we're in a 
an amazingly terrifying situation and I need some advice. Aren't you glad for fathers and mothers and that you can just look to and say, hey, this is what's going on. And, and so I got up because Japan's 16 hours ahead of us in time and, and he emailed me and he'd given me an encouraging word and some advice. And so I, <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. And, and, and so as I was laying in bed, I still couldn't sleep and there's just something stirring in me. And so I went, I got up, and I, I was sitting on the couch, and uh, the Lord just said to me, I, I want you to start a church, and I want you to start in your home. Wow. And I just went, oh. And you know, there are those times when God speaks, and you're just like, that's the voice of the Lord. Yeah. And I just was like, oh, that's God. And my first thought wasn't like, hallelujah, Father, I thank you for your direction. My first thought was, what will Jamie think? You know, oh my goodness. And so as I'm laying there thinking, and, and I began to hear the word Sivan, S-I-V-A-N. And it's, that's just rolling up in me. I have no idea what Sivan is. And I'm just like, this is really strange that I'm hearing a term so clearly. And it sounds really Hebrew. And I heard the Lord say, it's linked to harvest. And so thank God for Google. I got on the internet. I googled Sivan and found out that it was a month in the Jewish calendar wow. that was linked, linked to Pentecost, which is the Feast of Harvest. Oh, wow. So God's speaking to me about starting a church. He's speaking to me about connecting. It's being connected to harvest. And he'd given me, and, and Pentecost Sunday was at that point several Sundays away, but I felt like the Lord was saying, this is when I want you to start and this is a ministry that's linked specifically to the harvest. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. And so Jamie, you know, the next morning I go back to bed and we wake up and I'm like, you just, I'm, I'm bracing myself. <laughs> it's like, you won't believe what the Lord spoke to me in the night. And Jamie said, you won't believe the dream that I had. So Jamie, I want you to just share briefly wow. the dream that in God good, and he speaks to his people. Just share briefly the dream that the Lord gave you that night. So while he's having encounters, I sleep. And, um, <laughs> and have I, encounters I, in your sleep. Yes, I do. And so I, I dreamt that um, I was standing in my house, the house that we lived in at that time, and I was sweeping the wood floors with a, a straw broom. I'm just sweeping it, and I'm cleaning it out, and um, in walks one of actually Andy's cousins, and he just comes in. Like, he does this all the time or something. We don't really have a relationship with this person at this point. And I, it was, but it was like he belonged there. You know, he just like, this is my house. And I just come in and sit down and hang, just came in and sit down. I'm like, hey, how you doing? We're just talk for a little bit. And I'm like, oh, here coming more people. Oh, I better go get some food out of the refrigerator, which is hilarious because there's never food in my refrigerator. And so I go and I open That's the refrigerator <laughs> and there are just casserole dishes, just food already prepared just dish after dish after dish lining my refrigerator. And I'm like, oh, okay. So put it in the oven, let's, you know, and people are just coming into the house and sitting down like that's what they do. You know, it was just like normal, people just did this at my house for some reason. And so I started um, just feeding everyone casseroles, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just whatever we had, I just started feeding them. And I'd go back and I'd get um, something out of the oven and I'd get something out of the refrigerator and I put it in the oven and get the other out and you know just keep feeding people just kept coming and then I walk to the refrigerator and I open it and I take out the very last dish I'm like what are we gonna do these people are still hungry and they're still here and they're still coming and so I put it in the oven and I turn and I look out my garage door which is towards the street and here come more people but they're carrying casserole dishes and here they come. They're bringing it. And I just go and I sit down at my dining room table with Andy's dad. And I, I sit down and I said, I think I'm good. I think I can just sit down here. And so we just sat down and ate dinner together and talked about all, I remember the conversations. It was really interesting, especially 11 years later, you know, and all of the symbolism and understanding dreams even more than I did than I do now, not that I understand a lot, but yeah, it was a powerful thing. I woke up knowing, I was like, oh crap, 
we're going to have to start a church. <laughs> Hallelujah. And here we are. And, you know, just... And, and, crap, right. Thanks, Jamie. See, if I say that, I get in trouble after the service. But here we are, and, and I think, you know, we're in a progression of what the things that we've seen. And just as, as the Lord is providing and just as He's giving out, there's more people coming into the house. And there's just a progression of what's happening. And I think we're in a strategic moment even further of what the Lord's getting ready to do in this season. And, you know, I, I, we think about times and seasons and, you know, just even as we, we sold our house on Friday, we, we're, we've just come into a new season and there's a whole new moment that's before us. And there's one thing, other thing I want to talk about before I talk about Pentecost and the three levels of Pentecost. But there was even a moment, you know, when we, when we started the church and we started as Harvest Fellowship, and because that doesn't sound religious, you know, and, and we didn't want to say church because that'd be too churchy, you know. And, uh, but we'd been in two or three different locations and we bought our first building, which was over kind of behind Aldi and Pick of the Day, and uh, we started there, there, and we had just bought that building, and I had a dream. And in my dream, and of course a prophetic friend named Darren Begley, we, the first time we met him, we would owned that building like three, four, five days. And he came by, and he's like, you know, the Lord tells me he's going to give you another building. And I'm just like, you don't tell that to someone who just like bought that building, you know. And he's gonna, he said, he's going to give you guys another building. And he said, you're just going to launch people to the nations, and was one of the things that God had already spoken to us. And so I had a dream in that same time frame, and I was standing in front of that building. And I was standing in front of our sign that said Harvest Fellowship. And the wife of Paul Keith Davis, who's a, a known prophetic guy, his wife walked up to me in that dream. Never seen the lady, but I knew it was Paul Keith Davis' wife. There's the alarm, right? We're not getting blown away, are we? Okay, flash floods, so Hallelujah. Yeah, everybody turn your phone off, right? And uh, so, but in the dream, she walked up to me and she pointed at me and she, you know, when the, when the prophet points at you in a dream, you pay attention. And she said, your vision is too small. And as she said that, the, the, the name changed from Harvest Fellowship to read Global Harvest Church. And there was something that the Lord's saying, I want your vision to be global. Because Harvest Fellowship was too small. And again, there are many words that prophets have given to us over the years about that. And, and, uh, but, but God spoke to us and said, there, there's something global before you. And so I just wanted to take those moments to say, that's how God planted this ministry. And we've seen God do various things over the years and and man, we're just in a season of increase, you guys. We're just in a moment of great increase. And Betty was praying it this morning. I mean, so many shifting in homes and jobs this year and just the provision of the Lord. And we just want to thank God. Yes, thank you, Lord. We just want to thank Him and acknowledge Him for what He's done and for where He's taking us in this season. So this morning, uh, first of all, I want to read. I want to read a couple of passages of Scripture. And first of all, I want to read in Exodus 19, verses 16 through 20. And, oh, I'm in Leviticus. I was like, oh, I don't want to read that. There are children in the room. Um, well, go to, go to Leviticus 19, you'll see what I mean. Exodus 19, 16 through 20. And it says, and so it came about on the third day, when it was morning, that there were thunder and lightning flashes. Hallelujah. And a thick cloud. <laughs> we're living it out, right? Up on the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. And when the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. Wow. And the Lord came down 
to Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. That's Pentecost in the Old Testament, right? And God was calling the people to hear him, to respond to his heart. But you notice only Moses got to ascend. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 2. Pentecost, the birth of the church in the New Testament. Hallelujah. Similar imagery, but this time everybody gets invited into what God's doing. That's right. Hallelujah. And it wasn't just Moses that went up, but it says in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So we move out of this place of only Moses gets invited into the fire and the glory, but suddenly the presence of God, the glory of God, the Spirit of God is resting on everyone present. And it's not just on the mountain where God is, is hanging out, but it's in each person. It's in each believer. He's distributing himself. He's resting on each one of them. Amen. That's the power of Pentecost. Now, there are basically three levels of Pentecost that God invites us into because Pentecost is not only the Feast of the Harvest, but it's the Feast of Open Heavens. Amen. Now, how many of you know we live under an open heaven? The resources of heaven, the anointing of heaven, the culture of heaven is available to each one of us because of what Jesus did on the cross. However, sometimes because we don't know how to activate, we talk about activation a lot, sometimes we don't know how to activate the blessings of an open heaven. And even though it's available, it's present, we don't live in it because we haven't activated through faith, thanksgiving, and obedience what is already available. Right? Right? If you go through some of my prophetic training and all that and some of the ways that we've been trained, you understand that God's already given us certain things. We just haven't activated them yet. We haven't activated the blessings. Right? So we can do that by obedience and by positioning ourselves in faith. So I want to talk about the three levels of Pentecost that He wants us, that God, through the Holy Spirit, through the cross that He wants us to step into. So let's talk about them. Amen. Now, the first level, and we're going to go stair-step in each one of these, but they're all very important. The first level is Pentecost is a celebration of abundant provision. Amen. Amen. Are you thankful for God's provision in the last season? Now, it's really interesting because Pentecost celebrated the re- release of provision from God to meet our physical needs. So what happened on Pentecost is they celebrated the harvest. And what they would do was they would bring in the first fruit of the harvest that they would receive because the whole harvest hadn't come in yet. But they brought in faith in expectation saying, God, only you have the power to bring bread from the earth to meet our need. Right? There's a process of harvest. There's a thanksgiving, and God, we're thanking you for what you've done. Now, don't get all nervous, but y'all, giving's in the Bible. <laughs> and so they, they celebrated the first fruits of what God had promised. And there were three levels to that. First of all, there was this element that, um, you know, th- there's a process of harvest. You guys understand that, right? The first, the first one, and this is kind of a shocking thing, but there's our work. Did you know that if you want to receive a harvest that you have to actually work? <laughs> our effort, our labor, our toil, we prepare the soil when you get ready to plant a harvest. Now, I'm not much of a gardener, but don't you prepare the soil 
isn't your effort involved in a harvest? Did you know Paul even said in, in 1 Thessalonians um, 3.10, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. And a lot of us are like, God, we just want your supernatural provision. God's saying, well, you need to put your hand to something. Because he wants to bless that. Our effort is involved. Our faith, our believing is involved in the process. You know, there are a lot of times that God, we're believing God to do something in a city or a region or a community. But you know where God, when Charlie Champ will be here, you know what Charlie says? He said, revival in this season's coming out of the local church. And you know who real revivalists are in this season? They're people who are contending day in and day out in the city, giving, working, laboring to see not only revival come, but to see it sustained. Right? As much as conferences are great, and man, I love conferences. Right? But it's the laboring in the local church and the preparing of the soil for what God wants to do that brings long-term fruit, right? So we prepare the soil, the first part of the harvest. The second part is we plant a seed, right? You know what's important in our giving is the planting of seed? A lot of us, and many times we all do this, we want God to bring a financial blessing and we haven't planted seed. Have you ever grown a garden without planting seed? If you are doing that, you are crazy and hungry. <laughs> you have to plant something. God set the earth in motion for seed to bear after its own kind. And if you if you want to let's make it let's make it not material so we'll settle down. A little. If you want to sow kindness, if you want to receive kindness, what do you sow? You sow kindness. If you want to receive forgiveness, what do you sow? Forgiveness. forgiveness. If you want to sow, if you want to receive financial things, what do you sow? Financial things, right? Y'all don't get all crazy and come. Never mind. I'm not going to say that. But and this, then there's the element of God's intervention, right? Because we're preparing the soil. We're, we're sowing our seed, and then God intervenes. And that's what Pentecost was about. It was saying, God, you haven't met every need yet, but thank you for the first fruit. Thank you for what you've given, and I don't have it all yet, but God, I trust you enough in thanksgiving and in faith to bring you what you're giving now in faith and belief that the harvest is coming, yeah. right? My need is not all met yet because if we need, wait for all of our need to be met, we'll never give, yeah. right? Yeah. This is so biblical, you guys, and it's so tied to Pentecost, right? It's faith, and don't worry, I'm not taking up another offering. But if we, you will never break the spirit of poverty off your life until you begin to move in generosity. And it's not just money. Right? Right? We, you, can, you can give and still not be a generous person in what you do. Right? But it, it, you begin to move in faith and say, God, I acknowledge you. God, you were so good in the last season. God, you're so good in the last season and I trusted you and you met me in the last season. And so, God, I'm bringing you my everything. I'm bringing you my first fruit in faith. And, God, I'm acknowledging you because, Lord, you're want, dependent on how I respond to you in this moment is how I break through and move into the next season. So we're in a moment when God's wanting to catapult us into the next season. So we're saying, God, thank you for what you did. Thank you for how you met us. Right? Thank you. I acknowledge that God, even, I can prepare the soil and I can even plant the seed. But unless you supernaturally intervene, God, it's still not going to happen. Right? 
And, you know, I'm not even going to read Malachi 3. But you know how the heavens open in Malachi 3? Through giving. And not just money. Right? So read that sometime. We won't camp out there, right? (laughs) Hallelujah. Guys, this is biblical. And it's God's plan. And if we struggle with this, God wants to break you out of poverty. Right? One, one of the things about an apostolic... Hallelujah. Right? <laughs> one of the things about an apostolic anointing when it begins to move is it breaks lack. And there's abundance, right? One of the things even about the pastoral anointing is it leads the sheep into food and provision in every area. Amen. It's not just the apostolic, but the pastoral anointing as well. So God's doing something. And you guys, I've watched over the last months as God has supernaturally provided to person after person in this body. Because it's really, really significant. It's really significant to see what God's doing. Promotions. (laughs) Hallelujah. She's thankful for the promotion. Amen. She's going in. They're going into a new season. And God met them in the last season. Right? Some of us got promotions in the the midst of great difficulty. And it looked bad. Laura, right? (laughs) But in the midst of that, in the midst of that, God, I don't know what you're doing. But I'm acknowledging that you're good and I'm thanking you. I don't understand, Lord, but you're doing something. And you're launching me into a season of greater harvest, greater prominence, greater authority. Now, make sure that you don't miss it because sometimes we think, well, the new season of harvest means, and maybe it is a new car, praise God, Mary. Dean, right? But sometimes it's greater, (laughs) sometimes it's greater authority. Sometimes it's greater impact. Sometimes it's just the the blessing of even the things that money can't buy. Right? That's what Pentecost harvest, that's what it looks like. Sometimes it's this moment when, yeah, the multitudes, God's setting people free in darkness... Because of our obedience, right? That's what harvest looks like. And God has called us to be a people and a place of harvest. Amen. So the first level of harvest of Pentecost is abundant provision. So God, we thank you, Father, that as a church, as a ministry, as people, as families, God, we thank you for how you've moved in the last season. And God, you've so met us. And Father, we just want to say thank you. Father, we say thank you for the last 11 years. And Father, we thank you that you're launching us into a new season of harvest, God, of provision. Father, of you meeting every need that we have. You you even meeting needs that have nothing to do with finances. But Father, you meeting us with healing. You meeting us with favor. God, you, you bringing in children, saving children, Lord, that are, that are backslidden, bringing in family members that we've been praying for. God, giving us the provision to start businesses. Father, giving us favor in the community, favor in government, God. Father, I thank you how you've placed each one of us in this city and in our communities to bring breakthrough. So, Father, we thank you for that today. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, so praise God. I'm, I'm really not prompting people to do this, y'all, but I love. <laughs> but sometimes there's an anointing to give, right? There's an anointing to give, and praise God, hallelujah. So the second level, supernatural revelation, right? Now, what happened on Pentecost, and some of you guys have studied the feast, so you know that, but God took Moses to the top of the mountain. And he, you know what he did with Moses on the top of the mountain? He gave him the Torah. He gave him. Now, don't get all 
bent out of shape and be like, well, the Torah is just the first five books of the Bible. And Yeah, it is, but God gave him. Torah literally means the teaching of God. Uh, you could say that all Scripture, if you want to get technical about it, is the Torah because it's the teaching of God. It's the revelation of God's heart and who He is and how He interacts with His people. And God said, Moses, here it is. I, I, you know, here you are. You're in the fire. You're in the glory. You're in the thunder. But if you want to know my heart, here's my word. This is I'm revealing to you. And to my people. And so God gave him his word. And so it's really interesting because at Pentecost, God revealed his heart to his people. And the Jews, when they celebrated Pentecost, what they would do was they would stay up all night and read scripture. That's how they celebrated, right? Now, there has to be a hunger. We have to be careful in charismatic and spirit filled movements that we, we neglect, don't neglect the Word of God. I love visions. I love dreams. I love encounters. I love supernatural experiences. But don't ever let that take you away from good doctrine. That's right. That's right. right? Because a, a lot of us now are in a, in a time when there's a generation that's saying, well, we don't think God moves this way because He's not like us. And the thing is, we, we know God partially through the Word, right? It's part of who He is. And so the, on the day of Pentecost, they would all, that's why they were all together in the upper room. God had commanded them to do that, but he'd all, they were, if God had promised in Acts 1-8 that He's going to pour out His Spirit and they're all going to receive power when He does that, and God had never quite done that before the way that he did in Acts chapter 2. It's so funny to me that people are like, well, unless God specifically shows me something that way in the Word, and the Word's important, right? Then I just don't see it. Well, he did something totally new in Acts chapter 2 that he'd never done before. Had, had people had tongues of fire and spoken in tongues before that moment? No. You know, and then they had to gather together and figure out doctrinally what was happening. Right? You see that numerous times in the New Testament, they're like, is this God? Right? So I bet, and again, I'm very much pro-doctrine, right? But in those moments, they're like, God said He was going to pour out His Spirit, and He's going to pour out power. And so, you know what? They probably studied times in Scripture where God poured out His power. They probably studied about Elijah facing off against the prophets of Baal that Jezebel had sent to destroy him. And they called fire out of heaven. They probably read about him going up in a fiery furnace and being taken out. Right? Maybe they read about Moses parting the Red Sea. Maybe they read all the acts and the displays of God because they're like, God, you're about to do something powerful we don't know what it's looking like, going to look like, but we're preparing our paradigm for what God wants to do. I mean, I, I think is you know, and we should be reading all the Word and all that, but I think there's just something about reading the Gospels in the book of Acts and to say, this is our paradigm. This is our normal. Right? This is what... Is, it's a launching pad. It's a beginning. Acts, Acts is the beginning. There should be greater things. You know, every rabbi expected his students to surpass him. Yeah, they all expected that. Jesus, who was a rabbi expected everyone and succeeding generations to surpass what he had done. We should be studying the things that he did. And I would even say that we should even, and you know, guys know that I do this, I say we should study revival history to see what God did and what's possible, even study where they missed it, so that we don't make the same mistake, right? 
you study revival history and you're just like, God, I'm, I'm, it's amazing what you've done, but I'm surprised that you're even still sticking around with us. Because sometimes we're so carnal and we've made so many mistakes, and yet God keeps trusting us because he's chosen to co-labor with us. And he keeps saying, you know, I know that you're a mess. I'm just totally, just as an example, right? Because she's here. You now, I told Jamie this morning, I was like, are you a mutant? Because she can do a superhero mutant, right? Because, yeah, That's Mike's like, it was a compliment to me. Because she can do so many things. She fixed my phone this morning, and I was like, are you supernatural? Right? But, you know, we all have places where we're messed up. And yet, God keeps meeting us. He keeps meeting us where we miss it. Aren't you glad? Yes. I'm so thankful that the Lord's not like, dude, I'm done with you. <laughs> right? But he just keeps showing up and he keeps saying, you know, I want to move. And I, I do, will, you, will you partner with me? Well, will you partner with me? And, you know, and I, I love, I have to get on revival history for just a minute. I love what God would, did with John and Carol Arnott in Toronto. And, and even, they got an impartation from Claudio Frazone, one of the main voices in the Argentine revival. And they came back to their little storefront church in Toronto. And God started moving, but some of the manifestations were really weird. And some people got upset. That's often a sign of revival, people getting upset. And, and they, they stopped the manifestations, but in, when they did that, it shut the move of God down. And so they said, God, we repent. We missed it, and we'll let you do whatever you want to do, and we'll just let you do it as long as you bring back what you were doing. And we'll put away... You know, we won't be constrained by traditions and sometimes even time limits. Uh-oh. But we'll let you do it, God. And, and God did it, right? And they invited Randy Clark in, who just got an impartation. And, you know, Randy's, I've said this before, but Randy's said the biggest miracle wasn't what God was doing in the manifestations, but it was that people kept coming. And it just kept growing because, again... Busyness is the greatest obstacle to revival in North America. And God began to move. God gave them a second chance because they're like, God, we missed it. Let's try this again. Isn't God good? So God wants to meet us with revelation. Hallelujah. So if you need some revelation, you know what you need to do? Study the Bible. Right? Filling our minds with God's word is essential to living in the blessing of the open heaven. Hallelujah. The third level is the, what we think of when we think of Pentecost. It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And just as the fire came down on Mount Sinai, the fire of his glory came upon his disciples. Right? A lot of times we want the fruit of the fire without getting the fire. Because fire can often be uncomfortable. Right? And sometimes we're like, we just want this, we, we want the fruit of the outpouring without the mess. That usually doesn't happen. Right? Let's, let's let the outpouring of the Holy Spirit come and affect us. Amen. These guys, they were clothed with power and the gifts of the Spirit were energized. Right? The early church, they understood the culture of presence. Right? You guys understand the culture of presence. Right? And, you know, we're in a culture right now where we, we try in the church to dumb presence down. Yeah. Yeah. 
because we think it's going to affect people. D did you know there were even, even in the early church? Yes, it will. <laughs> did you know in the early church that unless you were baptized, you couldn't even take communion? Right? In the early Methodist church, you couldn't even go to their services until you went to one of the class meetings. Small group where they ask you, how is it with your soul? You know, and, and they saw incredible results. And the Methodist uh, church grew the movement because, I mean, even John Wesley was an Anglican and he didn't want to start a denomination. Right? But, but they didn't make it seeker friendly. There was the fire. Jesus was like, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you need to move on. Wow. That is the, the most less, least seeker-friendly thing I've ever heard. Right? It's like, don't follow me then. <laughs> you know, in, in the early church, they, they waited on God. They came in and they stayed up all night. They weren't even binging Netflix. And they, they read the word all night and they prayed together and they said, God, we don't know what you're about to do, but do it, God. Do it, Lord. And we're waiting on you. And you can even go past 12 o'clock. 12.01, that's as far as you got. <laughs> now, don't worry, y'all. I'm almost done. Everybody gets nervous when you start preaching services like this, and they're like, oh, he's going to take up an offering. Or he's going to go to a 1230 today, right? <laughs> but they knew how to enter the blessing of an open heaven because they, they understood the culture of presence where really it was about, and, and should we see people born again? Yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's one of the driving hearts of the Father but when we enter into his presence, his presence can do more yes. in a few moments than all of our effort, mm -hmm. right? I love that quote from Reinhard Bonnke. The, the less Holy Spirit we have, the more coffee and cake we'll have to make up for it. <laughs> and I am pro coffee and cake. I eat good on the cruise i got to get back to the gym. Oh, my goodness. Right? And my stomach's growling all the time because I'm like, oh, I haven't had second breakfast yet. <laughs> Sushi at 10? Yeah, let's do it. Right? <laughs> 10 p.m., right. <laughs> Pizza at 9. Um, <laughs> always a hobbit, right? But they, they positioned... <laughs> They position themselves for the move of God. And they gathered together and they were like, God, we don't know what the next season looks like. But, <laughs> anybody feel that way? <laughs> like, God, we don't know what the next season looks like. But God, you were so good in the last season. Even when we didn't understand... Did you know part of embracing the goodness of God is just like, you know, God, even, even in the, the moments that were a, a little bit crappy, you met us. You met us. That day we sat in my mom's funeral. And I felt like we'd lost. And we're sitting there, and I'll be honest, I hated the service. If you're going to preach about Lazarus, you better believe for the raising of the dead. And, and I bless my brother who was in that service because he did love my mom and my family. But we're sitting there, and I'm just like, God, I really hate what he's preaching. And I know my kids, and they hated what he was preaching. 
I'm being real raw, y'all. And in that moment, I look down, and my hands and my clothes are covered with glory dust. And I looked, and Jamie and my kids, they're all covered in glory dust in the midst of that moment. Even when we were mad. We were grieving the Spirit, I'm just saying. We really were, because we were mad. And, and the worse the doctrine got in the funeral message, the thicker the gold dust got on us. And I, I just was like, God... And I, I don't know if there's any theology for this. I don't know if my mom's up in heaven going, Jesus. <laughs> Bless his heart. <laughs> He's mad. He's the son of a redhead. <laughs> but can you do something? In the middle of this moment that we don't understand, and I know they don't understand, and I'm, I'm not making doctrine out of any of that. And I know some of you have been there in your hurt and your loss. Just like the day we gathered around mom and prayed for her on Mother's Day and blessed her and prayed for her healing. And she just got covered in gold dust. And she said, oh, I've always wanted to experience this. And I think in those moments, and I don't understand why God can do that, do that and not bring healing. I don't get it. right? But I know I love Him and I trust Him. And I can just picture Mom up there like, just do something special. Because I think we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And again, I'm not trying to make any doctrine of anything, but there are moments when heaven invades earth. And she was probably like, look at all these people at my funeral. You know, because she loved to throw a party, right? She threw her own last party. You know, and I, I think there was something of just the, the goodness of God. All my life, you've been faithful. All my life, you've been so good. And we sang that today, and I wasn't even thinking about some of the loss that we've gone through, but I was just thinking about, God, you've just been good. And we stand here in this moment, in this season, regardless of the difficulty. Lord, you've always been so good to meet us. So I challenge you today. Look over the last season and even, even ask, you know, here's a good inner healing technique. Ask Jesus, in that moment, Jesus, where were you? And he'll show you that he was present in those moments. If you weren't aware of it before, he'll show you how he was there and how he met you and how he loved you and how he sustained you even in the hardship, and thank Him for it. He knows it was hard. He was probably more heartbroken than you. Right? But He was there. And in those moments, just take a moment and say, let's just do that right now. You guys, I had no intention of doing this, but Jesus, show us First of all, those moments of pain in the last season. Show us where you were in that moment. Show us where you were and where you met us and what you did. It won't take a long time. He may show you more later, but I know he's showing you things. Let's just take a moment and thank him. Jesus, thank you where you met us. Holy Spirit, thank you that you encountered us in the good places, in the difficult places, that you sustained us, and that you even used other people to bless us, and you even used other people to pray for us, 
and you used other people to stand with us and love us. But, Lord, you met us like no other. We're so thankful for the last season, what we learned, how we grew, how you provided, how you were so supernatural, how you healed, how you sustained us. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, that in this, this next season, we go in with strength. And we go in with thanksgiving. Lord, that you're meeting us with abundant provision. Lord, that you're meeting us with revelation, not only by your spirit, but by your word. And Lord, I thank you that you're meeting us with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what I felt even this morning as we worship together. Just the, the, your kingdom advancing. Your kingdom advancing in this city and this region. I thank you. We celebrate you, God, today. Not just for this anniversary of this place, God, and I'm so thankful. But Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in the city. Thank you for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we can live in at this moment. And we celebrate and we rejoice today, God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Isn't he good? He's so good. And I just believe that he's working for your good. He's working for your good today. Hallelujah. Well, wow, it's so good. What a beautiful presence. What a beautiful presence this morning. So I just want to say bless you guys. Remember um, Wednesday. What time is it again? Six. Um, you can find, if you haven't been to Lake Ardmore, basically exit 33 off the interstate right there at Veterans. And right there's a road right across from Flying J. Get on that road and go to the end of that road. And when you get to the gate, you're there. Okay. And so we're just going to have a good time. We're going to celebrate. And um, if you need prophetic ministry, we'll have our prophetic team here. If you need a physical healing, the physical healing team will be here to minister. And bless you guys. Have a great day. We love you. We're so thankful for you. Amen. Bless you guys.